Man, I, I tell you what, it is such an honor uh, to, to serve in, in this church. Uh, it is an honor to be able to stand before you and proclaim the Word of God. You know, there is not a single pastor out there that is worthy of such an honor. There's not a single one. So it is, it is with great responsibility and yet the mercy of God that we get to stand and preach God's word. Would you open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3 this morning? Let's see what God's word has to say to us. And if you want to put your finger in another spot, we're going to jump to another spot for part of this message in the book of Genesis. So you have your finger in the back, like, you know, just a few, few pages in from the book of Revelation. And then on the other side, the, the very few pages in from the first, from when you open that book to the book of Genesis chapter 4. And I want to start with just a word of prayer and ask for God to, to be present, to, to work in our hearts and to help me. And so let's pray together. Father, you are so, so good. What a privilege and an honor and a joy it is to enter your presence in conversation with you. We, your people, are so delighted and so thankful that Jesus opened that door, that he tore that curtain and allowed us to have entrance into the holiest place through his blood. As we have celebrated over the last few weeks, the, the time of Easter and the Palm Sunday leading up to Easter, the, the presentation of the Son of God who was put to death for our sake, who was buried, who rose again. God, we, we continue every day, every Sunday to worship and praise and follow a risen, living Savior. So we are here this morning asking you to work in us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would cultivate our hearts and you've plowed the ground, you've prepared us, you've prepared us for this moment even. Whatever it is that you want us to hear, to do, to respond to, God, I pray that you would have your way in us. You would find receptive hearts, willing hearts. And God, when we, when we find ourselves doing, we give thanks because it is the work of God, it is your Spirit's work that it even made it possible. God, I ask for your help with my mouth, with my words this morning, with the direction. I pray that you would guide every last word. May it be accurate, may it be faithful, may it be loving and kind. I pray you would help us, Lord, to be people of your word. I pray and I ask this in the mighty and awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I, I feel a, a heavy somberness in, in one sense, and yet I'm about to break that when I introduce the title of today's sermon. It is, I want to know what love is. I want to know what love is. Sorry, that's all we're going to do for now. <laughs> okay. Is that song familiar? <laughs> Came from a great decade, too, by the way. <laughs> wow, how do, you go from, how do you go from there? I want to know what love is. And, and you know, Christ's followers, we've been instructed to love one another. But do you know what love is? Do you want to know what love is? There's something about love, isn't it? We know, and even in the song that we just, the chorus of the song we just heard, I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. You mean you can't just say, I love you. That's not enough? No. We've got to live it. We've got to act out that love, that 
decision, that intentional act of the will, we must act and show our love. And when we do, it's our goal and our hope that when we, when we know that we're loved, we feel. I want to feel what love is. Now, the song title and the artist probably has nothing to do with biblical love. So that's as far as we're going to go with that song. All right. But we understand that love is something that has to be seen and felt. And that's what we're, we're going to dive into a new section of First John today. The, the last section closed up. There's kind of an indicator we'll talk about in just a second. But we're going to be in First John chapter 3, verse 11 through about verse 18. So we're going to start by just reading the text. So let's read the text. You know, it's on my heart. I don't always do this, and I'm not always going to do this, but would, would you be willing to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning? If you are unable, that is okay. But let me just, let's, let's stand today. John writes, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother, and why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech but in action and in truth. Thank you. You can be seated, and may God bless the reading and now preaching of his word. Verse 11 kicks off with this phrase, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, and this is kind of why some commentators, myself included, believe that this is, is a distinguishing moment in the book, because in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, he said, this is the message we've heard from him. And declare to you, God is light, and there's absolutely no darkness in him. And that kicked off kind of the beginning emphasis of the book of 1 John, that God is light. And as a result of that reality, God's light exposes sin in our hearts and our lives of his children. And when he does, his children surrender that right to self-rule, that rebellion, that sinfulness. We surrender that and say, God, we were wrong. You are light. You are right. And you have every right to me. And so we, we've seen this whole, this whole thing play out through these last several, well, a couple of chapters and verses here. And, and now the new emphasis in this, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning, is we should love one another. And the next several verses and pretty much the rest of the books has a lot to say with emphasis on how we love one another. And here's, here's the statement. Here is, if we walk away with nothing else, if we hear this and, and walk away with this, I think we'll do better. And that is that God's children should consistently and continually love those who are in God's family. It is an ever-present love. Now, now, don't take this and go, well, Pastor Justin said, I only have to love my family members in Christ. And go tell your neighbor that you don't love them. Okay, now don't do that. That's not, we, we clear scriptural indication that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, even those that are not in God's family. So John is not saying that we only love God's family, but I think what he's saying is the hardest people to love are God's family. I mean, y'all are easy to love. <laughs> we all get along in here. Interestingly, one of the first things John has to say about love is what it is not. You ready for that? Did you like that? 
And so it brings us to the first of our three points today, and I'll mention points. I, I hope you will follow along in some way, taking notes, mental notes, draw pictures, whatever it is that helps you grab a hold of God's word and hang on to it. But here's our first point. Love is not hatred. <laughs> Come on. Look at, you're like, Pastor Justin, duh. But I think we forget. I think we sometimes don't define what hatred is sometimes. We justify it. It's not hate. I just strongly dislike that person. It's justified anger. They just haven't earned my respect. Christians acting in sinful, unloving ways can be some of the most cruel people. The example John gives is Cain. Now he finishes verse 11, we should love one another. We get this clear understanding, simple statement, we should love one another. But John knows we need a little help to understand that. And he says, unlike Cain, who is of the evil one and murdered his brother. And then he asks a great question. Why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, does that actually sound like an answer to you? Really? Really? You know, why did you kill your brother? Jaden, Josiah, I've got brothers right here. Jaden, why did you kill your brother Josiah? Did I get it backwards? You, you know, right? You know, well, my deeds were evil, his were righteous. Wait, can you come again? Can you explain that a little more? Because I, I don't follow. Right? What is, it, what, what is he talking about? Well, number one, he says he, he is of the evil one. Cain, who hated his brother, was of the evil one. Remember in, in 1 John 3, verse 8, just, just a couple verses up from where we are at verse 12, I guess more than a couple, several, whatever. He says, the one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. So he refers back to Cain and says, he was of the evil one. He was of the devil because of his sinful heart, his sinful nature. So John takes this practical example of Cain and Abel to help these believers who would know that story to understand as he relates it to what he just said about being of the devil and how to actually love because love is not hatred. He was also this one who murdered his brother. Murder is the kind of thing that the devil does. Did you know that? Jesus' own words in John 8, 48, he says the the devil has been a murderer since the beginning and a liar. But why this? Why did he murder his brother? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Have you ever noticed that righteousness and, and a righteous person, and I don't mean totally sinless, I just mean someone that's been saved by the grace of God, and God has shaped their heart, and they become more and more Christ-like, and, and there's certain things they just won't partake in anymore. There's certain things that they're not going to say, and they're not going to do, and you put them in the middle of a group of people, maybe at a workplace, who, who don't have the same heart and mind. Does it trouble those who, who aren't Christ followers, who aren't righteous, when that one righteous person kind of comes in? What, what is it about that? It's kind of exposing, isn't it? You know, when everybody does the same thing as you, everyone's telling the same dirty joke, everyone's getting involved in the same gossip and the same anger and the same frustration, you kind of go, yeah, we're together on this, yes. But when that one person walks in and nobody understands why he won't join in, it's kind of like, well, oh, maybe I was wrong. Whoa, no, that can't be possible. I'm not wrong. And so usually what do we do? We, we, it's like I'm part of that outer group. (laughs) What do they do? They look at that righteous person and they got to do what they can to trip them up. I worked in construction for a couple of years of my life, right out of high school. I was bivocational, serving at a church, but I, I wasn't paid for it, so I did a job. And I was one of the few that didn't talk a certain way and act a certain way. And you know what? They, they, would, they would wait for me to do something like hit my thumb with a hammer and they would watch. word. Oh, not this time. Yeah, there's just something about it. Righteousness disturbs evil. 
Let's look at the account. I told you Genesis chapter 4. We're going to see the account of, of Abel and Cain. and Let's see if we can learn from it. So Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 is where we start there. It says that the man, this is Adam, first man God had created, he was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. So Cain's the oldest brother. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. She also gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks. But Cain worked the ground. So some time has happened from giving birth to now Cain and Abel working in the fields. They could be young men, maybe 20s, maybe 30s, maybe two or 300. I don't really know. But Abel is a shepherd of the flocks and Cain a farmer. He worked the ground. Is either one of those right or wrong? No. They just, they just are. They're work. Work is honorable before the Lord. So they're both doing these jobs. Verse 3 says, In the course of time... Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. Now, we don't have any other information about, there's no written law code, right? Moses comes later to know what is the right thing to do. What, What should they have offered to the Lord? I don't actually know that it was wrong. This is what I was taught in Sunday school, but I don't know that it was wrong for Cain to offer the produce from the land. In fact, later, the Levites, or the Levites, the, the children of Israel, when, when God gives them the law through Moses, they're to give a portion of the first fruits of their crop, of their harvest. So I don't see the act being wrong in and of itself, nor Abel. We also see the, the animal sacrifice being encouraged and ordered by the Lord when it comes to his people. So we don't know. Now, but here's what it says in the middle of verse 4 where we left off. It says, the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. So in other words, God, God accepted Abel's offerings, you know, basically, well done, I received, wow, good, you've done well. Cain, and no. So how does Cain respond to that? He was furious, furious and despondent. He let himself get all depressed over this. Let me ask you this. Since the offerings are made to the one who is righteous, doesn't he get to determine what's acceptable or not? Now, Abel, I want you to note, Abel's not mocking Cain. Right, that wouldn't be righteous. What it Abel could have been <laughs> God accepted mine, not yours. See, righteous people don't have to revel in their righteousness to make someone else feel uncomfortable. And what's Cain's attitude like? Could have been humble, right? I mean, think about it. If if you made an offering to the Lord and you sincerely wanted to please the Lord and he did not accept your offering, is the attitude of like, okay, well, seriously, I want to please you. What what would it take? Lord, forgive me for bringing a wrong offering or a wrong attitude. Like, what can I do to make this right? Wouldn't that have been an appropriate response? Do you think God would have responded with acceptance and regard to a heart like that? I'd like to say I think so with a lot of confidence. But no, it was angry, it was furious. So in Cain's response, who's in the driver's seat? Who's God? Cain is going, I am. He says, I get to have it my way. God, I brought my offering and you should accept it. There was a heart problem with Cain. And God, knowing the heart, had no regard, did not accept Cain's offering. Verse 6 tells us, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious? And why do you look despondent or depressed? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. Now, in English, we might read this a little goofy, right? When you hear something, its desire is for you, we usually think of that in a good way, right? This is not a good thing. 
Because when someone's crouching at your door, even if it's for a surprise birthday party, it's usually not a good thing, right? Because you're about to have a heart attack. Don't be crouching at my door. I mean it. Don't come crouching at my door. My wife has a... Four. Never mind. I don't want to publicly admit uh, anything there. <clears throat> wow. Sin's crouching at the door. It's desires for you, but you must rule over it. Essentially, the Lord tells Cain, I would gladly accept your offering. Do what's right. Put me as king. Surrender your heart to me. But understand, if you don't, sin wants to enslave you. It does not have your best interests at heart. So watch out. So we see Cain takes it to heart in verse 8. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. Probably because they want to make things right. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Maybe not. Cain was revealed to be of the evil one who murdered his brother. John writes that Cain's deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. This is not a moment of, I just wasn't thinking, I got mad, I, I, knocked my I shoved my brother, he fell down, hit his head on a rock and died. This was calculated. This is premeditated murder. Hey, brother, let's go out into the field where no eyes are. And he attacks him and kills him. Should Cain have loved his brother? Of course. Right? We, we know God's command, love one another. And, and tells us in family to love one another. They're brothers. Of course they should have loved one another. But Cain did not. Even if the words came from his mouth, bro, love you. He killed him. He showed he didn't love him. And you know what's strange is when it comes to things we do wrong, when it comes to embracing sin, we usually feel justified in what we do. We don't usually think that we're doing wrong. I kind of suspect Cain didn't feel like he was really doing wrong. He embraced that self-rule even when he brought the offering to God. He demanded and expected that God accept his offering. And he got furious when God didn't. But then he saw God accept his brother Abel's sacrifice. All he had to do was humble himself before God and give to God what was appropriately God's and God would have accepted him. But instead of loving his brother, he turns in jealous anger towards him and an idea is born in his mind that comes out into action and he kills his brother. You know, because somehow Abel being dead would make Cain feel better. It would make God accept his sacrifice because he doesn't have another one to compare it to now. Oh, God's not fooled? A God who knows the heart and the mind, even the intentions of the heart. You should, look at, you should look up those verses and find them where God knows the heart and he knows the motives and the intentions of the heart. Man, they are wildly exposing now, perhaps you're thinking, you haven't murdered anyone, so you're doing okay. I hope you haven't murdered anybody. Some strange looks coming up this way right now. But when we act on hatred in our hearts towards somebody, we are murdering. We're guilty of the sin of murder. Whether we act on that hatred or not, it's going to come out of our heart. We might act out on it in words or other actions. We can't help but act on what's going on in our heart. That's why it's so important that our hearts genuinely are born again into God's family, being changed by the Spirit of God. I suspect Cain was unaware of the hatred in his own heart. John continues now to unveil the difference between those who are in Christ, those who are of their father, the devil, or of their father, the Lord. Verse 13, he says, Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. 
don't be surprised. There's a difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. If you belong to Christ and you begin taking on his righteous character, the world is going to notice and they're going to hate you. And that doesn't mean that every single person that's not a Christ follower yet is going to outright hate you and try to murder you, thankfully. But the world system, the, the world that is of the father, their father, the devil, does hate you. So understand that. Hatred is a strong dislike. It's a hostility towards somebody. It, it literally has the idea of killing in your heart. So if you hate somebody, you have a desire to see them dead in your heart. You'd rather them dead than get away with what they're getting away with or whatever. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Don't marvel. Don't, don't be shocked by that. They hate you because like Abel, God has accepted you. And not by your merit, not by your good works, but because Jesus rescued you. And the world hates you. Shouldn't be surprised by that. Jesus himself tells us that in John chapter 15, verses 18, and really on through like verse 25, but I'm just going to do two verses. He just, Jesus said, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. There's strong, illogical feelings against people who are Christ followers. So you know what, brothers and sisters? Take joy. If you realize that some of the world around you has expre expressed hatred towards you because you are a Christ follower, take joy. On the other hand, if you find that there's a hatred in your heart towards somebody, we should do some self-examination. If there's bitterness towards somebody, if there's people we'd just rather die, then we might want to take a hard look at our own attitude towards Christ and what he's done for us because if we're acting and functioning like the world that hates Christ, what does that mean for our actual soul? Let's not deceive ourselves. The second point I want to make today is that possessing eternal life, knowing that you are in Christ, is revealed by your love or your hatred. You're going to be doing one or the other. And that's what he gets to in verse 14. He says, we know, we know that we have passed from death to life. Because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death, he says. Now, this, look at the word past. We know that we have passed from death to life. This is a word that means we have changed from one state to another. And by the way, there's no going back. This is a, this is a complete change. One was a living death. And the other is a full life. Eternal life. Perpetual life in God's spirit. And he says, because we know because note that he's not saying that we uh, he's not saying that we pass from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. He's saying we know that we have because we love our brothers and sisters. Do you see the difference in that? We know that we we know that we are in Christ when Christ affects a change in our heart where we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, even when they're not real lovely sometimes. He's not saying that we earn salvation by, by loving our brothers and sisters. It's a, it's a restatement of all the other expressions of putting our faith in Christ. But we ought to know that we ought to see that there is an impact, there is a result of that salvation, and if we don't see something changing in our hearts, maybe the heart didn't really change. We simply know that we are in that state because we have a new capacity to love. Remember earlier in, in, the, in the book, I think it was chapter 2, he said, we, you want to know that you know that you are in Christ? You want to know that you know? Obey his commands. Keep his word. Walk like Jesus walked. So you just can fill in the blank. Now he's saying, love your brothers and sisters if indeed you know that you are in Christ. 
Then he says the one who does not love remains in death. And there's that word remains again. To abide, to, to live there, to make your home somewhere. And if you don't love, you have made your home in hatred. And whether you like it or not, that is death. So you're making your home in death. But you've been given life as a follower of Jesus. You see, those don't go together. Life, death doesn't go together. I cannot point to anyone in this room. I can't say, son, you're both alive and dead. You're alive. I see your head bobbing, right? To not love is to remain in death. And let me just say that there is a present tense concept with this word that means that it's a continual nature. Because look, we're all human. We all have our moments that we have not loved the way we should love. Even those that are truly Christ followers. But this is the practice of consistently loving that I referred to earlier. Okay, when we stumble and we act in an unloving way, we get back right and apologize. We, we say that was wrong and I correct my behavior. See, we don't live in that death. But when we go, well, I, I simply don't love you and I'm not going to love you. That is not what Christ followers do. You can make a profession of faith. You could pray to receive Jesus into your heart, but if you didn't mean it and you aren't seeing love develop, you remain in death. You know, I think that's why the church gets such a bad reputation in the world around us. I think it's probably one of the biggest reasons is brothers and sisters in church families do not love one another the way they ought to. They'll go talking about each other. They'll beat each other up. They'll chew each other up and spit each other out. We've got to cultivate love for our brothers and sisters. And if you find yourself getting bent out of shape over something, maybe we just need to be kind of people that pause and choose to love, to act righteously. You know, I'll, I'll refer you to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to learn more about what God says about love. There's several things I just want to mention. One, he says love bears all things and believes all things. That's about the person. When we look at one another and we, we start hearing some of that juicy gossip and we, we stop believing what's best about them and we start believing something else, we're not acting in love. Maybe you get angry over something that you feel is justified because your preference is more important than theirs. Your conviction is better than theirs. Not to mention love is patient. Love is kind. Even if your preference or conviction is more correct, biblically speaking, even if you could make a 100% bulletproof case that your preference, your conviction is 100% right, by the way, that's extreme language because I don't think any of us from preferences and convictions are 100% right. When we believe that we are right, and we ought to study to believe that we're right, but we think we know better than somebody else, love is patient and kind. We're going to go, hey, bro, I think you need to move this way. Come on. Come on. Oh, you don't want to move? All right, man, I'll kind of hang out here with you, but I just want to keep, I just want to point this way. But what happens a lot? You don't agree with my viewpoint? <laughs> Unfriend. <laughs> and then, message all our friends, did you know what someone so said? Can you believe that they are such a... I, can't even, I don't even think they're Christian. Love isn't envious or rude. <laughs> That's 1 Corinthians 13. I didn't read them all. Let's go back to 1 John. Verse 15, he says, Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. Can we just stop for a second? 
we are we, we do those things and we act in hatred towards somebody and we kind of go, well, I mean, you know, we're justified. They were, they were unlovable. They didn't have the right conviction and right preference. And so we're just going to, I mean, it's okay. Like that was justified. Did you hear what John said? Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. John, can, can I mean, a little gray, please. And you know, he doesn't stop, you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. What? You know, that's not a hard point to make, is it? Have you ever tried to witness to somebody and you talk to them about the grace of God and you talk about how you cannot out the grace of God? He would forgive even a murderer. Have you ever seen somebody react to that like... <gasps> No, and I'm not making, I'm, I'm making light of it, but I don't mean to make light of it, okay? Like, I have talked to people, and, you know, God would have forgiven Hitler if Hitler would have bowed his knee to Jesus at the end of his life. And they're like, oh, no, I don't want to be in heaven with Hitler. Praise the Lord, you won't. Hold on. <laughs> well, hold on. Um, if Hitler gave his life to the Lord before he died, he's in heaven. So if you're not in heaven with Hitler... I'm not trying to say you're in hell, okay? What I'm trying to say is Hitler's not going to be Hitler in heaven because Jesus saved him, changed him, gave him a new mind, a new heart, a new glorified body. John is pointing out that if someone who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ is hating his brother or sister is obvious not a Christ follower, not actually one who possesses the eternal life found in Jesus Christ, Christ who set the perfect example of love, who changes our hearts through the indwelling Holy Spirit to love others. The Lord God is a knower of hearts, and we understand that what is in our hearts comes out in words and actions. And hates is a present tense word, meaning that we continue presently hating, even when it is exposed to us that what I'm doing is hatred, it is not love, and I need to stop. If you act in a way that is not loving, you're acting with hatred. And if hatred is our response and our continued response, and yes, it's a choice, then we are called murderers. That's strong language. But it's strong on purpose. This should not be so in God's family. There are strong laws on the books for murder, isn't there? Even in the United States. I mean, even in the world at large, for the most part, there's not many nations that don't have strong laws on murder. Even self-defense requires a lot of justification. Do you know it was one of God's top ten? You ever heard of the Ten Commandments? That, that one, thou shalt not murder. You know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. That's, that's such a no-brainer. No one thinks that Hitler's a Christian, right? Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, I don't know, name, name your serial killer, the murderer person that you despise because of what he's done. Maybe you despise what he's done. We have people in the church who say they love one another and then they attack and speak terribly about someone else. We have people that turn a blind eye to someone in need in their own household, in the church family. And I'm not picking on any one circumstance or person or anything like that. I'm just saying in general, this happens too often. And it takes us back to chapters, chapter one's idea that if we say we have no sin or that we have never sinned, then we're, we're deceiving ourselves. So he's not saying that we say we do this perfectly. Is when we do say we haven't sinned or that we don't sin, that we're deceiving ourselves, we're liars, we're making God out to be a liar, and the truth isn't in us. So if we call ourselves Christ's followers and we act in hate rather than love, then we are deceiving ourselves, we're being liars, and we're making God out to be a liar, and the truth isn't in us. So it is vital that Christ's followers have actually experienced God's love and that they love their brothers and sisters in Christ. To do this, we need to know what love is. Point number three, Christ's followers 
learned. I didn't say they have it mastered. They learn. Christ followers learn to love like Jesus by laying our life or lives down for others. That's what he tells us. That's the example he gives. In verse 16, John writes, this is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Oh, we got some learning to do, brothers and sisters. We got some loving to do. It doesn't come from us manufacturing our own love by just digging deep and loving more. It's not a secret. It's not a mystery. It has been revealed by the one who is love and who gave himself for us, laying his life down for us. His life was not taken from him. He laid it down for us. He chose to give what was to us most precious, our lives. He gave his life. So we know the love of God because we have tasted it and experienced it. You, you ever had that moment, that realization when you came to Christ and you felt the love of God for the first time? And sometimes it's, it's so much more than intellectual, right? We hear it and we know it and we go like, that's amazing. And all of a sudden we just feel this washing over us of a love that is rich, that cannot be understood fully. And, and it's so much more than we can comprehend and deserve. And we just are amazed and speechless. Do you have a moment like that in the love of God? You've tasted it. You've tasted it. We encountered the historical Jesus who laid his life down for us, and we have entered a relationship with him as his children. You know, Jesus knew that, and that's why in John 15, 13, he says, no one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You want to know what love is? Look no further than Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus set the example for us, and not only did he set the example, but he is the source of the love we're to use in loving others. So how can we lay our lives down for our brothers and sisters? That's what we're told to do. How can we do it? We could literally die for somebody. That might happen. I think those are rare circumstances, at least generally speaking. But are you prepared to lay your life down to die for somebody? That, that would be an honorable sacrifice to show. I'd rather me die and let you live on. Do, but, but when we think about that, like if we would give our lives, if we would die for somebody, if we would give the greatest gift we have, the gift of life, what would we hold back? Is there anything in our life that we would hold back? Do we hold others in higher honor than ourselves? I think of Philippians 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Laying our lives down means that we should help with physical needs. That's what John says. Look at verse 17. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Again, no-brainer. I love John. He's a lot of no-brainers in here. If you have this world's goods, you have some money stored up, you have some house, you have some cars, you have some clothes, you have some food, you have tires on a car, whatever it is, you have this world's good and you see a fellow believer in need, a brother or sister, this is someone that you take note of. Not just generally we know people are struggling all over the world and we give our $25 here and $50 there, but I mean you walk in this church building, you get to know somebody sitting next to you and find out they need new tires. They're driving to and from Dallas every day trying to work on a single income and feeding a family and their tires are bald and it's going to be dangerous for them to drive back and forth, but they can't afford to replace the tires, but you can what are you going to do? 
Help them with tires. By the way, my tires are fine. <laughs> Other than a couple of nail repairs recently, but that's a lot of building going on in our area. <laughs> maybe it's a need for groceries. Maybe it's an electric bill. Maybe it's some medical expenses. Maybe it's a ride to the hospital. Maybe it's a ride somewhere. But we have to take a moment and understand what are the needs are of the people around us, and we can actively show love by meeting some physical needs. But he says, but the one who withholds compassion from him. You know, the, the literal reading of this in Greek is to, to close and lock the door of your heart. Well, really, of your gut, to be real literal, but we understand that in the terms of heart, okay? Right? You, you have plenty extra. You can afford the $800 for four new tires for that person. And, and you go, man, or at least maybe you can get your Sunday school class together to help with that. You know you can meet that need, but you don't. It's like going, oh, man, I see that need. That's, that's closing door and locking in case that wasn't clear. We turn around. We walk away. We... sounds more like hate than love, doesn't it? How does God's love reside in him? And one guy put it this way, you know, because we think of these, again, broad general terms. We think of just the, there's worldwide need. There's foster kids. There's orphans everywhere that need help and support and parenting. And, and there's people in need everywhere. People need tires. People need groceries. Inflation is at a crazy rate. What are you going to do? Well, as one man put it, loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. So let us know our brothers and sisters in our own church family and make sure we don't leave someone in need if we have it in our power to help. Now, John sums up this command and this expectation to love in verse 18. And, and quite honestly, I probably should have done a whole sermon on verses 17 and 18, maybe 16 through 18. And maybe I'll talk about it some more down the road. But John sums it up. Little children. You don't, don't you love how he goes back to that? Little children. As a dad that wants the best for you, hear this, kids. Hear me. Let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. inactive, one word, inactive love isn't love at all. We can say, love you, bro. Love you, sis. But if we don't put some action with that and show it, we're missing it. If your actions don't follow your words, your words are worse than meaningless. They're harmful for the testimony of Christ. Let us love in action. In two words, in action. Put it into action. When there's a sickness and illness, are you present? Can you bring a meal? Can you mow their yard? When there's a financial need, will you give? When there's a physical need, do you share? And when there's a difference, do you seek to understand and still love and maintain fellowship with that brother or sister? Let us love in truth. In truth. There's no pretending in truth. And that means sometimes when there's sin, we might have to point it out or let someone point it out. And we want to encourage obedience to Christ and let's support those who need to move that direction and keep moving that direction, which by the way, we're all works in progress trying to move that direction. May our love be functionally true by doing what we say. It's kind of like James when he says that faith without works is dead. You can say you have faith, but if, I, if I'm not yelling fire, 
But if I yelled, there's a fire on the other side of that wall, if you don't believe me, if you didn't have faith in my words, you probably would just sit tight and be like, whatever, bro. But if you heard and believed that there was a fire, you put faith in my words, what are you going to do? You're going to respectfully get up, file out carefully so that everyone can get out. Something like that. so true that love without action, love that has no deeds with it, is meaningless. You want to know what love is? Love is not hatred. Our love or our hatred, it reveals whether we possess God's gift of eternal life, whether we are in his family or not. So Christ's followers let us learn to love like Jesus did. Learn to lay our lives down for one another. Father, I ask for your help because we need it. And Father, I ask for us to experience and taste more and more of your love so that we have the capacity, we, ha we are filled up by your love and able to pour it out to others. God, may we be a people that represent the greater church, the worldwide church, but may this body, this local expression of your church body, of your family, be pleasing to you by the way we love one another. God, help us to pray for each other. Help us to support one another. Help us to meet physical needs. Help us to be engaged in encouraging one another to walk with you. Help us not to pretend that everything is okay, but help us to walk in truth and love both in deed and in truth. All for your glory. All for your name's sake. For our good, we pray and we ask that you would help us with these things. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.